All right, we're going to continue our study on the parables. And tonight, we're going to look at a parable in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. And the actual parable begins in verse 28. It's called the parable of the two sons. I know what? What are you? <laughs> okay, so can someone tell us just for the sake of review? what parable we worked on last week parable of the prodigal son and i said that you could actually call it the parable of the two sons or some people call it the parable of the two prodigal sons this is not the same parable obviously so i thought it would be good to look at this parable after having looked at the parable of the prodigal son because they have something in common that we want to use as an interpretive lens. So stick your finger in Matthew chapter 21 and then flip over to Luke chapter 15, where we were last time. And in Luke 15, verse 11, we read these words. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. That's how it starts, right? Now go back to Matthew 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. So I want you just to to spend a few minutes with me reflecting on that phrase, a man had two sons. And let's think about what comes or what expectations we have when we hear that. So when we hear a man had two sons, what do we expect to follow? Okay. We, if we expect that one is older. We expect that one is good. Hmm. Interesting. We expect differences. So when we are introduced to two, we anticipate a contrast. Is that fair? If if it's short and I can repeat it, I'll let you stay there. If it's long, I'm going to make you walk. So go ahead. Birthright. Birthright. Exactly. So if we have two sons, we're assuming that one is older and has access to property and blessing and privileges and that there's somebody who is going to be left wanting. So we think about birthright, um, birth order. We expect that one of them is going to be good. (laughs) Okay. And we're looking for some type of a comparison. Now, I want us to take a minute and reflect on this again. A man had two sons, and I want you to think about any example from the Bible you can think of involving two sons. If it's short, I will repeat it. If it's long, you got to go to the mic. All right? Cain and Abel. Jacob and Esau. Isaac and Ishmael. Show yourself. Who said it? (laughs) No one? Okay. A voice? Okay. Anything else? Can we come up with any other? All right, we'll start with these. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael. So now I need somebody to come to the mic and tell me about one of those pairs, and then someone else tell me about another pair. 
What do you know about Cain and Abel? What do you know about Jacob and Esau? And what do we know about Isaac and Ishmael? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve. Sons of Adam and Eve. Okay. okay. Who's the oldest? Abel. I think Abel is the oldest. I can't Try remember. Again. Cain. <laughs> yes. Okay, Cain's the oldest. They're sons of Adam and Eve. What else do you know about Cain and Abel? That one was jealous of the other. Okay. Cain was unhappy slash jealous, felt had bad feelings towards Abel. Do you remember why? Because he felt that the Lord accepted his sacrifice more okay. than he accepted Cain's. Okay. And so that's where the jealousy, to me, that's where yes. the jealousy came in. And because of that, he killed his brother. Yes. And then when the Lord came to him and asked him why, he turned around and asked God, who am I, my brother's keeper? Love, all right. Break that story down, Deacon Lorraine. So, yes, Cain is the oldest. Um, God has regard for Abel's offering, not Cain's. Cain's not happy about that. Kills his brother Abel. And when God comes to find out what happens, we have that famous line, am I my brother's keeper? Because God asked Cain, where is your brother? And he said, how am I supposed to know? All right, that's Cain and Abel. Someone want to tell us about Jacob and Esau or Isaac and Ishmael? Okay, let's make sure I get it right. Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was the rightful son and, and had the right birthright. Ishmael was the uh, son of the concubine Okay. And Sarah made sure that Ishmael was taken away to okay. protect Isaac's birthright. Okay. And because she was jealous. Okay, so hold on. Stay right there. Okay, so who was the who was the daddy? Um Why are you ask me when it's tip on my They're tongue? They're telling you. <laughs> Abraham. Okay, so Abraham's the father of Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac's mother was Sarah. Sarah. Ishmael's mother was Hagar. Hagar. And so there were, you mentioned the word jealousy, which is interesting because that word came up here in this story as well. There's a rivalry amongst them, at least on Sarah's part, that she's not, she's not a little concerned about the role Ishmael's going to play in the family once Isaac comes. All right, now, the $64,000 question, bonus round, who was born first? Ishmael. Okay, firstborn Ishmael. All right, well, great job. All right, now who wants to take on Jacob and Esau? All right, here he comes. Jacob and Esau, what do we know? Jacob deceived Esau's dad based on the fact that he had cajoled Esau into selling him his birthright. Okay, okay, so Jacob deceives their father. Do you know who their father is? Yes, Isaac. Okay, so their father is Isaac. And we have Abraham, okay, and Adam. So Jacob deceives Isaac, and he gets Esau's birthright, all right? What else do we know about these brothers? Who's older? They're twins, but Esau is older, all right? So we anticipate some kind of comparison because we have a history of hearing stories about a man with two sons. Who is Jesus' audience in this story? He is talking to the chief priests, the people who would have known the tradition. Why does this matter? It matters because it means that as soon as Jesus said a man had two sons, he has set them up. They are primed to hear a certain kind of story. And in that story, there's going to be a firstborn and everybody else. There's going to be a chosen and the ones who are not. There's going to be the one who gets the blessing and the one who doesn't. So they expect a certain scenario to play itself out with those simple words, a man had two sons. So hear that because in our own culture, there are things we are primed to hear when depending on the opening words. 
If I say, once upon a time, you are going to anticipate a fairy tale which is why I would never start reading a Bible story with the words once upon a time, because somebody without me saying another word would be offended. What is she saying? So we have this cultural expectation that comes, and Jesus' audience has a cultural expectation that comes when he says to them, a man has two sons. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, not only people who knew the tradition, but people who were charged with holding, maintaining, guarding, protecting, and interpreting the tradition. So we have this series of sons. Does anybody remember who Jacob marries? Rachel and Leah. They're sisters, right? Which one's the oldest? Leah's the oldest, all right? Which one does Jacob love? Okay. <laughs> so what's interesting in the Jacob story is that the rivalry between these brothers is reflected in the rivalry between these sisters. Now, we have already said the oldest child is the one who gets the birthright and the blessing. Those are two separate things. All right, so in the story of Esau, Esau loses them in two stages. First, he sells his birthright to his brother for the food, the beans, and then he's tricked out of his blessing when the father is dying. All right, if you've never read the story of Jacob, it is in the book of Genesis. I highly recommend it. It is better than a soap opera. Um, But what we observe in the story of Jacob and Esau and in the story of Isaac and Ishmael and in the story of Cain and Abel and in the story of Rachel and Leah is an interesting pattern. So the expectation is that the oldest child gets the blessing and the birthright, yes? In reality, it doesn't work out that way in these stories, right? Jacob gets the birthright and the blessing. Isaac is the second born, but he is the one through whom the blessing comes. Rachel and Leah, it's the second child or the younger daughter who has the love of her husband. Neither Cain nor Abel are the ones through who the line continues, but the child who comes after them, Seth. Now, Jacob, through the help of Rachel, Leah, and their handmaids, Zilpah and Bilhah, has 12 boys and one daughter. Who's the oldest? Almost Reuben is the oldest. The blessing doesn't come through Reuben, all right? So it works its way out in a couple of ways, all right? So here we have a history that tells us we are supposed to expect one thing, but we get another. So there is inherent in the tradition something that messes it up. And the thing that messes it up is God. Because essentially, culture says this is how it's supposed to work. And God says, I will choose the person that I choose. I will work through the person that I will work through. All right? Now, that's all well and good so long as God's choosing us. All right? So we like this tradition because we identify with the people that God chooses. So the holders of the tradition don't have a problem with this because they identify with the ones through whom God has worked. All right? But over time, this community makes the mistake of trading in that understanding for a birthright. In other words, just because I know the story doesn't mean I get to predict how it's going to play itself out. Just because I read it and rehearse it and study it doesn't mean that I get to speak for how God is going to move. So that somewhere along the line, 
in the keeping of a tradition that shows us that God does really squirrely things, that God would pick Jacob. Are you kidding me? That God would work all around all of the cultural rules to choose the person that God wants to choose. Somehow the people who kept that tradition forgot that and in their own context began making decisions about who was going to be in the kingdom of God and who was not. All right? That is some of the background for the parable that we have today. So what we want to hear when we hear the words a man had two sons is that things do not always work out the way we think they will when God is involved. God is a God of surprises. Now think for a moment about the parable we worked on last week. Last week we did the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. And I think at some point... I asked you all, what's wrong with this story? And we had quite a list of things that were wrong with the story. It is wrong on many levels. It's wrong that the younger child asks for his share on several levels. It's assuming he has one, A. B, asking for it would mean that he would want his father dead because he's not supposed to get it until his father's dead. And my own personal addition to that list is he asked for it and he lived to hear an answer, all right? Because from my context, there's certain things you just don't get to ask, all right? So it's wrong on those levels. Then it continues to be wrong because he spends all the money. Then he returns home. He has no right to do that. Then he's welcomed. That makes no sense. Then there's a celebration. So there's several things wrong that we see culturally in the story, but I want to point out perhaps the thing that's wrong most of all. If you understand a pattern or an expectation that the oldest child is the one that's to be followed, the story should go, a man had two sons. The younger one said, give me my portion. The father gives it to him, and he goes away. And the rest of the narrative should follow the older son. Why does the story even follow him? There's something crazy about the attention that is put on that child. So there is an expectation when we hear these words, a man had two sons, for a certain scenario. But I want to suggest to you that Throughout the history of this phrase or this mindset, things have been turned upside down. We see that in the parable of the prodigal son. Now, look at the parable in Matthew 21, beginning in verse 28. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to read the parable first, then I'm going to step back and we are going to work on the context where does this parable appear, all right? Verse 28, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Okay, is that pretty straightforward? All right, do we have any immediate questions about this just in terms of making sense we're not going to go deep we're not going to get to sermon stage just yet but are there any things here that prevent you from understanding this story or does it make sense as it is and went on talking about the tax collectors and prostitutes uh, and they're probably sitting there like me 
wanting to hear about the sons. Okay. So he shifts, okay? All right. Let's, any other questions? Okay, let's look at the whole chapter. Go back to 21, verse 1. And what I'm going to do is give you some chapter and verse divisions. And then I want you to make, well, I was going to say, I was going to ask you to help me make headings for each section, but some of your Bibles are going to do that for you. Okay, so first we're going to look at verses 1 to 11. Look quickly through verses 1 to 11 and tell me what those verses are about. Okay, verses 1 to 11 is about triumphal entry. Okay, what about the next section, verses 12 to 17? Jesus clears the temple. What about 18 to 22? Barren fig tree. The what? Barren fig tree. The fig tree, the barren fig tree. Okay, what about after that? They challenge Jesus about what? I'll put questioning Jesus' authority. Okay, 28 to 32, a man had two sons. What about 33 to 46? Parable of the tenants. Parable of the tenants. And what, now I'm going to go a little bit further. Chapter 22, the first 14 verses, what do we have? Okay, the marriage feast. Now, when you're working on a text, you can take the passage you're working on and read it. And I always say make sure it makes sense to you because sometimes the Bible doesn't make sense straightforward. Um, so you want to read it and make sure that the narrative makes sense as it appears. Then the next step would be to look at the context. And there, you can think about context on three levels. Um, and by context here, I'm talking about the context in the text, not the cultural context. So one of the things you want to ask yourself is what passage comes before and what passage comes after. And then the next thing you might want to do is look at that larger surrounding area. And then if you want to get really crazy, look at how this story ties in with themes we see for the whole book. All right? Because the Gospel of Matthew emphasizes different things than the Gospel of Luke emphasizes. So that we can do this work layer upon layer upon layer. When we look at this material, we're going to do a little work on genre, all right? Are y'all still with me? All right. So triumphal entry is a story about Jesus coming into the holy city, right? So that's what we call a narrative. It's a story, right? What about the next section? Jesus clears the temple. What's that? Also a narrative. So we've got a story. We've got a story. What about here? Another story. So we've got this whole narrative, and what about here? More narrative. So we have this kind of progression. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. We're following Jesus. And then, in response to the question that comes out of the narrative, we get what? A parable. And we have seen this before. Something happens, a question gets raised, Jesus answers with a parable, which is not the most direct way to answer a question right? We've, we've gotten that for sure, right? 
So here's a parable, and what comes after that parable? Another parable. And what comes after that parable? Another parable. So remember last time when we were looking at Luke, we saw the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coins, the parable of the prodigal son. That sometimes we get a stacking of parables. They each can stand on their own. They each have integrity on their own. When we read them together, sometimes we are invited to take something from here and use it as a lens here. Sometimes we will think about whether these are connected thematically. So tonight, we're going to look at the first parable in this grouping of parables. But this one comes to us after a series of story, after a series of narrative. Are we doing okay? All right. So now, let's just try to walk through a little bit of what happens. And I want to invite you, if you have time this week, to read through these and begin to ask yourself if you can pick up on key words or themes, because one of the exciting things that happens in Bible study is if you find a word, say, here, that shows up again, say, here. All right? And then that connection, some, if it's the word the, it doesn't matter. If it's the word and, it doesn't matter. But sometimes it is a substantive word. And we call this word study. It's one of the ways to begin to open up a text, all right? And it's fairly easy to do. So first we have the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. This is the triumphal entry. This is what we commemorate and celebrate and revisit on what Sunday? Palm, oh great, we got it. On Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry. And then he goes from that high to a scene where he clears the temple. All right? So let's just think about that for a minute. When there's a triumphal entry, what does that say about who Jesus is? What? Yeah. He's, for those who are listening on, who are streaming, he said... Jesus is high in the poles. What, what does it mean when Jesus marches in or rides in and they say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Someone come to the mic. Tell me what that means, why it matters. Why do we have Palm Sunday? Um, that he was the answer. He was the answer. He was the Messiah, the one who had been promised. So it is this public, can we say, political acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah. This is a huge deal. So we go from this big moment to the next scene where Jesus clears the temple. Now, this is not such a happy moment because what happens here? Jesus is mad. That's right. So he goes in the temple. He drove out those who were selling and buying. He overturned the tables. All right? I love this. Um, this is our antidote to Jesus meek and mild. All right? Not all the time. Um, he said, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. All right? Um... Now look, after that moment, what happens? I, you've got to love scripture. The blind and lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. First he turns over the tables, then he cures those in need. All right, you've got to love Jesus. When the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things he did and heard the children crying in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? Yay, that comes from the Psalms. He let them, went out to the city of Bethany and spent the night there. So now think about it. Triumphal entry, acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. Then he comes into the temple and does this thing. Now, what makes Jesus think that he can do that? 
Like we read it because we think, oh, it's Jesus. But what made Jesus think he could, could do that? I mean, I had, a, I had a question as well in addition with that. Um, I like this church. I like learning. I like the way you interact with the people. I, I like that. <laughs> Good. Um, because it's like we're doing now. It's, it's for learning. Grasping, yes. receiving the word. And if we, yeah. if we got all the other stuff going on, it takes away our distraction and the focus on the worldly things and making money, greed, fighting, and all the envy and all that stuff. That's right. My question was um, to have an understanding about when he, when he turned the tables over. So they was gambling, they were selling popcorn. What, they was, were, what are the things that's considered not <laughs> They were selling popcorn. Videos, that's DVDs, ATM machines, all that, you know, all were, that stuff you see. I just want to know what's <laughs> right and what's wrong. So I they, have an understanding. That's a great question. When people came for Passover, um, they came, some people made this pilgrimage once a year, and if you were coming from an outlying district, you may not be able to bring your sacrificial animal with you, all right? And so you could purchase something there. And over time, it, the sellers, it's like the gas station right next to the airport when you have a rental car. The sellers became aware that you needed them and so they began to exploit the people who were buying. And that's why Jesus says you've made it a den of thieves, because this is not the time for you to jack up the price and make a handsome profit. All right? So Jesus is right in his sentiments, but think about it from the perspective of the Pharisees. What is Jesus doing that is so offensive? And the hint is it's in what he says. So if you read what he says, you can tell me what would have been offensive. Come on. You don't have to ask to come to the mic. Just come. He took ownership. He took, and, yes. And he called, he had the unmitigated goal, I guess, back then. It was, oh, well, God's my father. But back then, that was actually saying quite a bit. He was, in, in essence, equating himself to God the Father. Good. All right. He speaks as one having authority. All right. He speaks as one having authority. That's problematic. And I would imagine the words he said probably were more incendiary than the action he took. All right. Because if he turns the table of, tables over, they go, oh, that Jesus, he's just so crazy. But then he said, my house. It is written, my house. So he's quoting scripture, but he takes ownership and acts as one having authority. Okay, triumphal entry. Jesus clears the temple. What happens in the next narrative? about Jesus coming upon a fig tree that was not bearing fruit. Yes. And uh, as a result, he, he told the, that there would never be any fruit on this tree. Yes. So he destroyed the tree. So, so Jesus is hungry. There's no fruit on the tree. And he curses it. And what happens after he curses it? All right. Immediately it withers. All right. Okay, now think about, I just want to point out one little thing. You know how we have these great lines or these great passages from the Bible? It's always nice to see where they come in. Because here's where we get, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved. And we always like just pull that out without thinking that it was in the context of this series of events that Jesus says that. So now Jesus again talks about faith. All right, now, next section questioning Jesus's authority. Now we have the chief priests and the elders. By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? All right. Then Jesus asked them a trick question. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? They argued with one another like if we say this we're in trouble. If we say that we're in trouble. So they said we don't know. And Jesus said if you don't know I'm not going to tell you. But then he goes on and tells a parable. So time out. Before we get to the parable, 
can we look at these four sections and see any themes that connect them? We looked at Jesus coming into Jerusalem as the, the son of David, the Messiah. We see Jesus clearing the temple. We see that Jesus curses a barren fig tree, and now his authority is questioned. So if you were editing a Bible and someone said, you have to come up with one heading for all four of these, what could it possibly be? Come on, look at, look at, we got something. Well, I think an overall heading would be the authority of Jesus because okay. every single one of them are about okay. authority. Okay, the authority of Jesus. That's a good one. I would say, I would call it the fall from grace. The what? The fall from grace. He okay. goes from being the triumphant hero through a series of um, actions and, and spoken word that causes him, him to, his numbers in the poll to drop. Okay, yes. So the, this is the beginning of a downward trajectory, if you will, moving towards his crucifixion, fall from grace, authority of Jesus, anything else. Those are both good. Okay. Much better than mine. Mine was JesusIsTheBomb.com. But I like yours better, okay? So if you take something like authority and think about Jesus exercising authority here and here, Jesus' authority being questioned here, Jesus' authority being affirmed here, it would be the authority of Jesus, the established or proclaimed or recognized authority of Jesus that inevitably leads to his crucifixion. Okay, he's gone too far. All right, so let's hold on to that because if authority works itself out in these four, it works itself out differently in each one. And I would also say there are other strands and other themes that you would be able to see in these four. So part of what we want to do when we're studying scripture is read and reread. Read it and then live a little bit and come back next week and read it again and see how the experiences you've had in a given week change the way you read the text. All right? Now let's look at our parable. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went, the father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Okay, let's break this down bit by bit. And it says that a man had two sons. But what's different about these two sons and the other accounts of two sons that we've had thus far? We don't know who the oldest is. It says first and second. And so there's something that is already subverted, if you will, because... It may be that the first is the firstborn, but it's not clear. It doesn't say older and younger. It doesn't say firstborn, secondborn. It says first and second. So maybe the first is the firstborn. Maybe he's the one that he runs into first. All right? So we have these two sons. The first one says, no, I won't. Okay, so let's go back to our questions with parables. What's wrong with the son saying no? And this, I need somebody to go to the mic. What's wrong with the first son saying no?
I can't believe that he told his father no. Right. And I can't believe that the father let him tell him and no. Remember what context we are in. This is not a world where children get to speak their minds. This is not a world where they have opinions and rights and all of that. Not 2014. This is a time where you, your father said go and you said yes. It is the same kind, it's that same kind of offense we saw in the prodigal son. That, that doesn't happen, all right? So there's something just terribly offensive about the son saying no in the first place, all right? But later, because he was still alive, he changed his mind and went, all right? That's, okay, so he said no and changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the second and said, I go, but he did not. Which of the two did the will of his father? All right, and they said the first. Then Jesus says, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. So who is the first son who says no and changes their mind? The prostitutes and the tax collectors are the first son who, said, who say no and then change their mind. Who would the second son be? The Pharisees say yes, but they don't. Hmm. What does that have to do with uh, this parable? The barren fig tree. What? <laughs> Come on. I, I don't mean to hold the mic, but I, you know. There's, you're not beating anybody down to get there. It's fine. <laughs> Um, f for the record, I never understood. I always got it backwards that he was rebuking them for their answer, which means the first son was wrong. But you just cleared that up. For that, I thank you. I think that the, the, the fig tree said, yes, I'm going to be a tree and bear some fruit. And it decided not to. Ah. And so he's like, ah, no, that's not allowed. You go just go the way of okay. bearing fig trees. Okay, good. Now, you said something that I didn't say. You said you were thinking the first son was wrong and I cleared that up. I don't want to clear that up. There is something wrong with the first son saying no. There is, but I always thought, yeah, he said no, but he repented and he knew what it was good for him. Right. And he f flipped it and went back and, and okay. actually did it. Whereas the, the second guy was like, yeah, I got you covered, dad. And he was like, yes. whatever, I'm going yes. out to That's deal right. with prostitutes and sinners. That's you right. Know. That's right. So I think what I want to suggest is that there's not a good son and a bad son. That the good son is whoever chooses to do the will of his father. So that the first son saying no is bad. Remember that? Yes. Oh, now I have people who want to say something. Come on. I just have a question. Uh, you said something about... Um, oh. You said something about the fact that they don't say no, but is it a is it a fact they don't say no or they don't reject? I mean, the, the, it, who it, doesn't say the, no? ch the child or the son? You know, p people do things, and and I guess a lot of bad things people don't reveal. But to me, th this parable just let us know that even during that time frame, people didn't do what they were supposed to do or reject. So. To me, in my mind, it, it tells me that even though, you know, we would think back in those days, people did not, was not combative and think it happened. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, I think the point I want to make is that it would have been offensive in this culture to hear of a son saying no to his father. Not that it couldn't have happened, but that it would have been just unspeakable. All right. So uh, let me give you an example. When I was a little girl in elementary school, my best friend, I was with my best friend and we were at her house and her mother told us we couldn't do something. And my best friend in first grade turned around and said to her mother, I hate you. When she said that, I ducked, all right? <laughs> it wasn't my mama, I didn't say it, but in my culture, no. And what a, so, that's the way I want you to feel when this son says no. It's not, because it's a parable, it's not that it couldn't have happened, but the point is that we feel that, 
okay? Right, that we understand how terrible it was because if we understand that, then we begin to understand what it is for us to disobey God. You see, God's thinking the only reason you were standing there forming your lips to say no is because you're, I'm allowing your heart to beat, right? From God's perspective, everything that we are, everything that we have comes from God, and then we're going to take the gift of life and look at God and say, no. That's the offense that we want to feel from this. Yes. And I was kind of thinking, too, um, oh, sorry, piggybacking from last week, and you were asking what's wrong, and I was yes. thinking about the parenting style for the prodigal son, right? So, yeah. And the older son was mad, yeah. right? And so in this one, too, it's the same thing. as one of your questioning authority, but it's the, the parenting style of the dad. Like, I'm going to let you get away with that, yeah. I'm gonna, and I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to just... Yes. And I, I guess my question in comparing last week and this mm -hmm. week is also looking at what is it saying about, you know, God as a father, as yes. the father figure and his authority yes. and how he treats each of that's us a good differently. Question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the term parenting style because the parable, if you think about it, is designed to accentuate one attribute of God for the point of the story. We know, and so the prodigal son and this story are construed in such a way to show that God is merciful, abounding in mercy, that God is forgiving. We know that, but if you go back to this story, you also know that there are times when we hit a limit, right? Or I shouldn't say a limit, but that there are consequences. So both of those elements are part of who God is, um, but these stories do want us to see God's tremendous mercy. You're right. And, and I think that the, the surprise of what God does in light of the child's behavior is there to show us how amazing God's grace is. So you're right on that. Yes. Yes. I struggle with uh, this part of this parable, and that is the first son said he would not but later changed his mind and he did go. Um, I believe by saying to his father he would not, he may have showed some lack of authority, uh, dishonoring his father by not doing so, but in essence, he later did change his mind and go. My struggle is with the second son who outright lies to his father by saying, I will, sir, but then chooses not to go. That's my struggle here is the, the, the choice of the second son or, or the choice not to do it, but also said that he would, in essence, lying to his father. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I don't know if he's lying. Maybe he meant to and he changed his mind. Maybe he, no, seriously. I mean, how many of us have been in church and said, Lord, I give you my whole heart and I will never gossip again? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, think about the kinds, of, like, there are times when you say, I will, but then you don't, or I will, but you won't, and so it's, I don't know, I want us to take, if we, if we move away from good son, bad son, you could almost see this as multiple moments in a person's life, so think about you know how we do this? We do this with Mary and Martha. You know, I want to be Mary, not Martha. Well, come on, people. The reality is some days you're Mary, some days you're Martha. Some days you say to God, yes, and you don't get around to it. And so we know what the right answer is, but our heart isn't there. And then sometimes we are like the, the first son, and we're like, no. But then we, out of whether convicted or what, we change our hearts. I think the reason that I want us to think about it that way is because it says a man had two sons. Both sons belong to the father. And it is the father's desire that both of his sons would honor him and do right. It is God's desire that all of us would be obedient, that all of us would have hearts after God. And I'm wondering if the reason this parable is here 
is because the people who are questioning Jesus' authority have a very clear picture of who is doing the will of the Father. They know what the good son looks like. The good son looks like them. The good son has all of the exterior things right. They're dressing the right way, they show up in the right way, and they say the right words. But if you are not bearing fruit, then Jesus says no. So I wonder if this is for us. I want you to think about it. How much? Okay, we've got a little time. I want you to think about it in terms of insiders and outsiders. And how you maneuver in the world when you're an outsider versus when you're an insider. And I want to suggest to you that when you are an insider, whether it be at work or at school or even in your you know, extended family dynamics, you take certain things for granted. But when you're an outsider, you have to work for everything. The people of Israel, the people who know this tradition, the Israelites were outsiders. All right? They came into, they were slaves in Egypt. Remember that? They came into a land of Canaan, and they were not the biggest or the strongest or the most successful nation. Their whole identity is formed around being um, marginalized and an outsider. But when marginalized people get a little bit of power, they repeat the behavior of the oppressor. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes have a little bit of religious power over their community, and daggummit, they're going to use it. And they will determine who's getting into heaven. And they will tell you what you have to do. And so Jesus, by telling this parable, is trying not only to subvert that system, but to reposition the people who were challenging his authority. All right? And so instead of saying a first and a second or an older or a younger or good or bad, he says two. All right? So today you are the son who says yes, but you're not doing it. All right? Then in not doing it, you have become the son who said no. So you can, just like, the Pharise- just like the prostitutes and the tax collectors who finally get it, you can have a moment of conversion as well and say yes. There's something, um, I, I grew up, I went to Christian school from kindergarten to 12th grade. I grew up in church. Um, and there is a danger in that. And the danger is that you begin to think that if you're not actively growing, that you're okay. Because you've gotten so much, and you can quote so much scripture, and you know every televangelist there is, and you've seen so much. But there is a danger in getting comfortable in feeling you're an insider. All right? So that the scripture is challenging us, do the work. This was, I'll tell you one more thing, then we're going to stop. So this was the opening, um, opening service um, at the seminary where I teach. And the dean said to all the new students, in addition to, no, I don't think he said addition. He said, before all of the other commitments that you will commit to in the next few weeks, and there will be many, the most important commitment is that you commit to personal devotional life every morning and every evening. And I want to tell you that as someone who teaches Bible and someone who works in a church, that is one of the hardest things to do consistently. You don't get once a day, okay? Sometimes twice a day. But we can never let ourselves think that the work we do for God substitutes for that time. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes forgot. They forgot their first love. 
And so in so doing, they become the child that says no, even though they think they're the child who said yes. Okay? Okay, yes. One more thing, then we're going to go. Um, to piggyback on what you're saying, um, for me, what I've come to realize, um, I guess Sunday when I joined, is, how can I say it? Help me, Lord. Um, how important it is, God was showing his unconditional love for us, even in our mess and our foolishness. That's why he sent Jesus down here to find out what's going on, what is going on. I give you everything. I, I'm yeah. blessing you with everything. I'm giving you an opportunity for everything. And you still choose, like Pastor Paul said, we, things that we should do, we don't do. Things we want to do, we don't do. That's right. And how important it is to um, study that word morning, noon, and night. That's right. He, he said in his word, it's very important because he knows how crafty Satan is. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our thoughts. He knows our likes, our dislikes, our needs, our wants. And he knows how to infiltrate and get us mm -hmm. distracted. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus, God said that it's important to study morning, noon, that's and night. Right. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you shared and for the courage it took. We have deacons here tonight. It is not a two to three week process. We will, we will work with you, all right? So just rest assured that your church family is here for you, all right? Beloved, it is time to go.